Welcome back to Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. We, I think we've worked out our technical problems now, and I'm delighted to say that Senator Mike Braun, Republican of Indiana, has been patient enough and understanding enough to stay with us. So, Senator, thank you. What I was asking you before, we were talking about opening up the state, and I was asking, can you do it county by county? Because as I look at the state of Indiana, there is a variation, as you suggest, between, for example, Indianapolis or Fort Wayne on the other hand, and some of the rural counties on the other. You definitely can, and our governor did a good job of kind of putting the emphasis on the disease early. And I don't think there are any businesses that don't know that it's in their own self-interest to pay attention to the guidelines. And many of the businesses that were determined to be non-essential could have been open all along because they had low traffic in some of those stores. Uh, so I think businesses are ready to go. They know that it's kind of a new normal. And yes, uh, we need to do this county by county because, as I said earlier, if we do the safest thing only, and I mean you still pay close attention to everything we've learned about the disease, we're going to be dealing with stuff we can't see now on an economic basis later. And some of that could be bankruptcies, uh, places not coming back. That's why it's important to be entrepreneurial from here forward to reopen. As you say, Senator, there's a risk no matter what you do at this point. There so the is. question is how you manage the risk. Are you confident that you have the testing capability in Indiana so as you start to open up, you can spot hot spots as they develop fairly quickly? So testing is an interesting question because everybody talks about it, and it's almost like you're stating the obvious. Uh, I talked to one of the uh, uh, CEOs of a pharmaceutical company in Indiana, and he said that has been an example of a really entrepreneurial endeavor to get the tests, get the reagents, and that's all been in the works. And we're going to have a cascade of them available. And the governor, again, I think has been smart and that he's going to focus them to the places that have had a flare up in the hot spots. And I think we'll have testing enough so that we can do it safely. And I think you'll see that more and more each week ahead of us. We've only known the genome of the virus a little more than three months. So I think we've done okay there. Everybody's been harping about it. And from what I understand, the 40 companies that are working on it have been doing everything possible to get them to the market to be used. Senator Braun, talk to us about the, uh, the food supply chain because you have a lot of food provided by Indiana. You also have a Tyson's plant that I think is something of a hot spot as well. Uh, are we concerned about the food supply chain? So when it comes to food supply and the processing of it, the process is more elbow to elbow than many production lines in regular manufacturing. So it does present a challenge there. But again, when I talk to the people that run these companies, the employees that have to feel secure working there, they've done a lot by putting like plexiglass barriers in between, maybe stretching out the line a little bit. If we would let food security become an issue, it's going to take what has been kind of a dire situation to date and even make it worse. And again, I see the companies that have, have to deal with this, they're not taking it casually because again, for the sake and safety of their employees, of their businesses, uh, they know they need to do the right thing. We got to be very careful with food supply because it's probably the most important component to get through this to where that doesn't get disrupted. So, so, Senator, we know President Trump invoked the Defense Production Act with respect to some of those meat plants, those meat processing plants. As I understand it, you think maybe they should also apply to some frozen fruits and vegetables? I did because I think uh, processed fruits and vegetables, generally in the canned form, would be the foundation for food banks. And when you really get down to a food supply, that is more transportable. It's uh, probably the basis of, and I thought it needed to be looked at in the same way as poultry and uh, livestock. So I think we just need to pay special attention to that part of our economy. And you got to remember, agriculture was the only stressed sector of the economy going into it. So many of the companies, especially from the farmers and producers up to the processors, maybe didn't have that balance sheet that allows them to get through as easily. Because the farm sector, when we get through this, still is dealing with historically high input costs, low commodity prices, 
and that reverberates throughout the food chain supply. As you say, Senator, the farm sector really was under stress and strain long before the pandemic happened. Uh, part of the relief of that was supposed to come with the deal with China, that so-called phase one trade deal with China. Do you have hopes that actually Chinese will end up buying anything close to the amount of food supplies that they had committed to? That has gotten to be such a complicated subject because of the whole discussion of how they handled it there. Uh, they are uh, an authoritarian, some say totalitarian, political system. I think that uh, showed its true colors during all of this. Uh, I think we've got to find a way for them to reconcile themselves with the rest of the world when it comes to the trade component that it looked like we had just gotten through and then the coronavirus rose in that country. It could t put us into a tailspin similar to the Cold War. I would hope that they learn from this liberalize maybe some of their political systems so they blend in more with the rest of the world and a lot of the onus the burden is on their shoulders and hopefully they will learn from this because the whole dynamic between us and them is not going to go away so, so finally, Senator, uh, you've been a senator for a while now, but you've spent a career really as a businessman. You know the business side of this. Give us your best judgment about how well we could do, best case, coming out of this year. We've heard the president talk about just phenomenal numbers. He may be uh, optimistic on that. Realistically, what can we expect for the economy through the rest of the year? So I think if we do what I've talked about from floor speeches before we left here, a really smart entrepreneurial restart into where we take some mitigated risk because they have so much of what could happen economically we can't see yet because it would cascade in a way that could swamp it into something tougher than 08 and 09. Since we were the healthiest economy that I've ever seen in the 37 years I was CEO of my own company, we've got the ability to not backslide, pay attention to what we know works, and yes, we could have a really strong resurgence. I don't know that that happens with maybe the speed that the president is looking at, but it'll be closer to what he's looking at than the opposite if we stay kind of hunkered down and don't try to maybe protect the most vulnerable a little better and then have a smart restart, an entrepreneurial, uh, rebirth of the economy and yes I think we can see good things sooner rather than later. Okay Senator Braun thank you so much for your time and your patience today with those technical challenges that we had. That is Senator Mike Braun Republican of Indiana. Coming up a little later in the program we're going to talk with Mike Froman. He is the vice chairman of MasterCard about exactly what the pandemic is revealing about some inequalities when it comes to the financial sector. That's coming up on Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. Welcome back to Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. President Trump is on his way to Arizona today, finally getting back out of Washington. He has been, has been eager to do. He's going to visit a plant that's making those N95 masks. We bring in now our Bloomberg political contributor. She's Iona College professor Jeannie Zeno. So, Jeannie, the president's wanted to get back out sort of on the campaign trail. He's going to visit this plant, going to visit with some, uh, some Native Americans out there. Is this going to change the political race? Yeah, I, I think the, the president and the campaign are feeling some heat at this point. As we look at the numbers, we've seen that, you know, the, the bump that he enjoyed, uh, brief as it was, has, has, has dissipated. And he's a bit underwater in terms of both his approval, in terms of, of controlling the crisis, and overall. So I think we see him really anxious to get out. And it's, it's not a surprise that he's visiting one of the key states, the swing state of Arizona, where recent polls have shown Joe Biden up by three or four percentage points. And so that, I think, signifies that they really do believe that it is time to get him out there in these swing states and to make sure that he can, he can hold these states. Such an important point, Jeannie, because as, as you look at the polling in presidential elections in Arizona, it's been going from decidedly red into sort of a purple area where it's gotten much, much closer in Arizona. At the same time, the president clearly is picking places where he can say, look at some of the good things we're doing on the coronavirus. He's trying to put together his case. But what does he need to do in order to really prevail in November? 
Yeah, and we've seen him do that. This latest ad they just put out on Monday, American Comeback, is very triumphant. It talks about, in particular, the return of the economy, and we know that his approval ratings there are much better than his overall approval rating and the crisis ratings. So he really does want to focus on the fact that he is handling this and America is set to come back, as they keep saying. And I think that is what he needs to do. I also think he does need to focus on the crisis itself and the fact that he can be trusted to handle it. He's still below Joe Biden in most of those numbers. And, of course, very important for him is the economy. And it's going to be in these swing states, as the campaign keeps focusing on, not just Arizona, but Wisconsin, your home state of Michigan and Florida. I think one of the most telling things is that his numbers have dipped a little bit amongst the uh, over-65 group in Florida. If he doesn't do well with that group in these swing states, he could be in danger of winning the election because, of course, the reason he loses the popular vote but wins the Electoral College is because he overperforms with those groups in these swing states in 2016. Any small dip there is a problem for him. Yeah, as you say, Jeannie, he has to truly establish himself as the one who is competent, who's really handling this crisis very, very well. Is part of that controlling the message coming out as well? And specifically, we see that now they've said basically nobody from the Coronavirus Task Force can go up and answer questions about a Congress without personal approval of the chief of staff. Is that going to work for them to control that message that much? Remember, when Dr. Fauci went up earlier, it caused a little bit of a concern. Yeah, I mean, I think we see them really trying to continue what they did, quite frankly, during the impeachment, which seems like so much so long ago, which is that they are unwilling to go before Congress and answer questions, to hand over materials, because they feel, even though it's a Republican Senate, they do feel that every time they have done that, that it has come back to haunt them. And so they want to control this message. They don't want their people going before these committees and testifying. And, of course, Congress has a right to be frustrated by that because their role is to engage in oversight. And, you know, like it or not, the White House is going to have to contend with a lot of oversight in this crisis, not just right now, but as we go forward and, and the Congress tries to figure out where the executive branch went wrong. This piece in the New York Times today about potentially the, the White House not being honest about the number of deaths they expect to see is something that they're going to have to answer for, if not to the New York Times and the press, but certainly to Congress at some point. Yeah, now on that very point, the president addressed that as he went to and uh, Joint Base Andrews, actually, and said, wait a second, those data were without mitigation. We're going to have a lot of mitigation. He tried to push back against that. But there's one thing that they can't control, and that's the virus itself. How vulnerable are they to the possibility of a, of a resurgence of the virus as they open up some of these states? Yeah, they're incredibly vulnerable to that, and that's where they have to be very, very cautious. We know from all the science that that is a distinct possibility. The president is walking this tightrope between being really focused on reopening the economy and getting people back to work and, of course, trying to make sure those numbers don't go up. And we're seeing some push. We saw Governor Christie, former Governor Christie, out in the press saying that it's time to accept the fact that there may be a loss of life, that we have to get back to work. The president is sensitive to that. That's the message coming from the right. That's the message coming from many of his supporters, like Governor Christie. And at the same time, that loss of life can be very, very problematic for him politically, not to mention in many other ways. Yeah, it's a really a tough choice, no question about it. Thank you so much, Jeannie. Always great to talk with you. That's our political contributor, Jeannie Zeno, who teaches at Iona College. And now it's time for Stock of the Hour. It's going to be Pfizer today because, as I understand it, they have a candidate in the race for a vaccine. And here to tell us all about it is Abigail Doolittle. They certainly, they certainly do, David. Pfizer uh, has announced that they are in these experimental vaccine trials with their German partner BioNTech. So we do have the stock popping sharply higher on the day and you can see that the German shares uh, have done quite well also and probably what stands out here the most David the very aggressive timeline because it was just four months ago or so even about three months from now where they were in preclinical stages uh, for this uh, vaccine this experimental vaccine trial they're saying there's some possibility that there could be some emergency use around this by September typically it takes 10 years uh, for a vaccine to go from the preclinical stage uh, to approved use. It's also very important, though, to see what's actually being promised, the amount that would be uh, available uh, and the, the manufacturing amounts. 
Um, but nonetheless, the stock is certainly popping higher. It's best day in almost three weeks uh, on these encouraging signs. So, so Abigail, unfair question, why Pfizer? Because there are some other drug companies that also have candidates in the race. I mean, Johnson Johnson announced one two, three weeks ago now. We have other uh, 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 candidates in the race. Why is it Pfizer? Or is this really going around to various drug companies at different times? Well, it seems that all of these big pharma companies are trying to get a vaccine developed to, uh, you know, really solve, quite frankly, this COVID-19 crisis, whether or not that happens, because the Ebola vaccine that was created a few years ago, that's the fastest timeline that I'm uh, aware of. That took five years. So the idea that it could happen so quickly uh, is, again, a little bit uh, perhaps hard to believe. From a financial standpoint, it won't really represent too much for any of these companies. It's not similar to a big blockbuster drug. They're not going to be able to price it aggressively. But I think that what they're probably looking for is uh, the star power of really solving a problem uh, for this crisis. So you have all these different pharma companies out there trying to come up with a vaccine first. Again, the timeline for all of these companies seems very aggressive, but let's hope that one or more of them uh, does in fact come up with a vaccine sooner rather than later, David. Yeah, as you say, it would be an awfully good thing for a brand. Uh, one last question, Abigail, which is there's also treatment as opposed to vaccine, for, for example, Gilead with remdesivir. Right. Uh, do those stocks get a similar lift when they get some favorable news? They certainly do, David. It was, it's actually sort of puzzling the Gilead lift this year. I think that stock is still up more than 20% this year and last week rallying on the idea that that uh, drug can be used to help. But when it helped, it certainly lessens the amount of time uh, that a patient is suffering, I think in that case, uh, by three days. So that's certainly not uh, a significant treatment or a cure or a vaccine. And it's not something that would change any person's behavior. It doesn't mean if you go out there uh, and you're somehow exposed to the virus that it will change that in any way. But nonetheless, any sort of mention around a drug or a vaccine uh, seems to send some of these uh, medicine, uh, pharma, and biotech companies soaring higher, David. Yeah, it's pretty understandable. Thank you so much, Abigail Doolittle, for that report on Pfizer, our stock of the hour. Coming up, we talk with the vice chairman of MasterCard. He's Mike Froman about their enormous effort to try to get banking services around the world. This is Bounce of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. Welcome back to Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Well, the pandemic is pointing out some problems we have in our society and our economy. We may have known we had, but boy, it's really emphasizing how bad they are. And one of the areas is in the extreme inequality in terms of financial services available to people. That's something that MasterCard has been working on for some time, and now they are redoubling their efforts. I'm pleased to say we now have the vice chairman of MasterCard, who's also president of economic growth for the company, Mr. Michael Froman. Actually, Ambassador Michael Froman served as trade representative under President Obama. So, Michael, thank you so much for being with us. Give us a sense of what this initiative is. As I say, it's an expansion, as I understand, of what you have been doing. Well, that's, that's right, David. Thank you for having me. About five years ago, MasterCard committed to bringing half a billion people who had been excluded from the financial system into the system. We achieved that goal uh, last quarter, about nine months ahead of schedule, and we decided that now more than ever, it's important to make sure people have access to the digital economy. So we doubled down. We've raised that goal now to a billion between now and 2025. We've also said it's really important to bring 50 million micro and small businesses into the economy. And because there continues to be a gender gap when it comes to financial inclusion, women tend to lag about 9% behind men in terms of being included. We're going we're gonna to focus in particularly on reaching 25 million women-owned or women-run businesses around the world. So, so Michael, give us a sense of the geography, for, ge geography first. I mean, how many of these are the United States? How many of them are, are overseas? Because MasterCard, of course, is a global company. Well, you know, there are about 1.7 billion people around the world who are still excluded from the financial system. Uh, most of them are in developing countries, but there are people right here in the United States and in Europe who are also excluded, people who are unbanked or underbanked. There are estimates that in the U.S. there's somewhere between 30 and 40 million people who have no formal relationship to the financial system. So a lot of what we're focused on, and it will vary from country to country as it has over the last five years, is figuring out how best to reach them. 
Sometimes it'll be through government disbursement programs. And for example, uh, millions of people will get their uh, economic uh, payments from the government on one of our, our cards. Um, sometimes it'll be working with, with fintechs uh, who have a, a capability of bringing people into the financial system uh, that didn't exist uh, five or 10 years ago. Um, or it'll be partnering with other companies. Uh, we have a partnership with a group called Neumann's, which is a big coffee trading group, to help put their workers, for example, in Mexico on digital payments. And it means that the, the worker, the, the grower of the, of the coffee, is getting 20% more for her product than she might have gotten before because we've eliminated the need to go through middlemen and go through cash. Uh, Michael, you mentioned uh, small businesses as, as part of this. Uh, give us a sense of what you're seeing with MasterCard, by the extent to which small businesses are drawing down on their credit as a practical matter, putting it on their credit card, or for that matter, just not buying things at all, maybe with reduced activity. Well, we're certainly seeing a, 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 an impact here. People are focusing on essential purchases like groceries and, and, and pharmacy purchases. Uh, there's a big movement from brick and mortar to uh, e-commerce. Uh, but, but even where people, where there is brick and mortar, where people are going face to face, we're seeing a big rise in what we call contactless payments, about a 40% growth around the world and people going and just tapping their card because they don't want to hand over their card to somebody. They, they don't want to handle cash. They don't want to have to put in a PIN number. And so being able to just tap and go is a safe and secure way of, of making payments. Uh, small businesses, as you said, are particularly hit by this uh, crisis. We've committed $250 million of products and services and financial support over the next five years to small and medium-sized businesses to help them digitize, bring them into the e-commerce environment, make sure that their transactions are safe and secure from cyber attack and, and from fraud. And that's going to be an area of, of continued focus uh, in the United States and around the world. Michael, one of the questions we're asking uh, almost all of us right now is, to what extent is this pandemic changing what we're going to be as opposed to just making us get there faster? Talk about the contactless payment. Is that someplace we were going to get anyway? And to what extent has that really been rushed because of this pandemic? Well, I think this crisis has underscored just how important digitization is uh, for individuals to be able to transact, to, to get payments from their government, uh, for small businesses to be able to, to be in contact with their customers through, uh, through e-commerce and to, to do transactions in some form uh, other than, than cash. So that trend was already underway, but I think this has accelerated it. Um, and certainly in the United States, which had lagged behind uh, a number of other markets when it came to contactless payments, we've seen a dramatic increase in demand for contactless. One of the things that we've heard a lot about from the major banks in part is reserving for possible bad credit because uh, people are going to have a tougher time paying their credit cards off when they come due, given the fact they're losing their jobs as a practical matter. What are you seeing at MasterCard and what adjustments are you making for that? So, uh, <laughs> David, I like to say that uh, uh, Apple's not a fruit. Amazon's not a river and MasterCard is not a credit card company. It's actually the banks who extend loans. <laughs> We're the infrastructure, we're the technology that makes the payments happen. And one thing that, that we at MasterCard have been committed to is, is being a multi-rail company. So we want to help people pay any way they want to pay. Maybe that's on a credit card or a debit card or account to account um, or digitally. So we want to make sure we have now the capability. We're the only global multi-rail company that can help people pay in any, in any way that they want to. And if credit's not appropriate at the moment, then they can rely on, on debit or account-to-account -account, uh, payments. But uh, uh, we're certainly doing everything we can to help our, our customers and their customers get through this crisis. A good lesson. MasterCard's not a credit card company, just like Apple's not a fruit, but you have a vantage point into that entire ecosystem as a practical matter. What actions are you seeing the banks take to try to protect themselves, where it is reducing lines of credit, or how do they confirm actually that their that their uh, uh, credit card holders still hold a job? Because a lot of them, 30 million or so, have lost them. Yeah, look, I, I think it's a good question for the banks in terms of how they're engaging with their uh, uh, with their with their consumers. We're making sure that, however, that evolves, that people can pay, that merchants can get paid, 
for products that they've sold um, uh, and are, you know, they're enjoying the guarantee that comes with a credit card payment. Uh, and so we're making sure that we're trying to make it as smooth as possible as banks and merchants make adjustments through this crisis. Okay, last question, Michael. I want to draw from your experience as a, the USTR, the United States Trade Representative, as well as your experience now at MasterCard. Do you have any concern that as people are looking around the world and saying maybe globalization went too far, that maybe some of the borders being put up in some places are not just for immigration, not just for trade, but could be actually for credit and for payment systems? Well, we do have a concern that uh, that that people will, uh, countries will sort of resort towards nationalism, nativism, protectionism. Um, you know, governments have absolutely legitimate uh, interests and concerns about, about privacy and wanting to make sure that they've got the best uh, possible financial infrastructure uh, in the country. But one thing that this crisis underscores, for example, is just how important that there, it is that there be really robust systems with cybersecurity protection, with anti-fraud protection, and that you're able to see trends in data across countries so that you can, whether it's the IMF or the World Bank or other institutions, take action to make sure you're addressing the, those who are most uh, those who are most vulnerable. And being having a global payment capability, uh, seeing having access to, uh, to to multiple countries allows that to happen. So uh, we're very committed to working with governments uh, through this crisis. Uh, we're, we're helping a lot of them, uh, both through our data analytics to understand the impacts of the COVID crisis and through our payment capability to help them uh, disperse funds to small businesses and, and to individuals. And we'll continue to work with them as we come out of this crisis to ensure that they've got strong and secure uh, payment systems uh, uh, in each country. Michael, thank you so much for spending some time with us today. That's Ambassador Michael Froman, Vice Chairman of uh, MasterCard. And now it's time for Bloomberg First Word News. And for that, we go to Mark Crumpton. David, thank you. President Trump says the top U.S. infectious disease expert, Dr. Anthony Fauci, was blocked from testifying to the House on the coronavirus this week because the chamber is controlled by Democrats. Speaking to reporters as he left the White House for Arizona, the president said, quote, the House is a setup. The House is a bunch of Trump haters, end quote. Last week, the White House said it would be counterproductive for top U.S. medical officials to testify before Congress while they're working to combat the outbreak. In Italy, experts are warning the country's gradual easing of its lockdown will most certainly result in a second wave of coronavirus infections. Health officials are calling for stepped-up efforts to identify possible new victims, monitor symptoms, and trace contacts. More than 4 million Italians went back to work Monday. Italy has had more than 211,000 cases of coronavirus. More than 29,000 people have died in Italy. Hong Kong will soon ease social distancing measures. The city has largely contained the spread of the coronavirus. Hong Kong has agreed to double the limit on public gatherings to eight people, and schools will resume some classes at the end of the month. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David. Thank you so much, Mark. Coming up on Balance of Power, we talk with the man who now heads logistics for the city of Los Angeles about how the city is fighting the coronavirus. He is Gene Soraka. He'll be right here on Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. Gene Soroka, for several years now, has been the executive director of the Port of Los Angeles. That's the biggest container port in the country. Now he has some new responsibilities as the chief logistics officer for the city of Los Angeles. And we welcome him now back to Bloomberg. So, Gene, thank you so much for joining us. Tell us what this new job is. About a month ago, the mayor of Los Angeles, Eric Garcetti, asked me to take on the role of chief logistics officer for the city concurrently while I manage the largest port in the nation. And the idea was to try to get these personal protective equipment supplies to our frontline medical folks and the hospitals. And we thought we had three opportunities here. One was to really speed these products through our port 
and LAX Airport, along with our domestic distribution network. Second was to find alternative manufacturing, not to step on the hospital's orders, but to try to find other folks who could supply us these important PPEs. And then thirdly, work with manufacturers, especially here in California, who wanted to convert their facilities to manufacturing goods that would be going to the hospitals, medical communities, and health areas. So uh, tell us about this one first big win you have. What is it, 24 million N95 masks? Tell us how that came about. Well, we were scouring leads around the world, and the work that we did with Honeywell yielded a, an agreement for 24 million masks over a 24-month period. These are the N95 NIOSH masks that are going straight to our frontline medical workers. Uh, did you have to bid against other cities, other states to get those? I mean, it's one of the things that we hear is sometimes people are it's going to the highest bidder, essentially. Well, what I can tell you is in the first several weeks of taking on this logistics role, we looked at the entire marketplace, really flooded with middle people and sales reps. Prices were going through the roof, orders falling through. In fact, we had five orders that never materialized for various reasons. So we decided that the best formula was to go straight to the manufacturer and develop those relationships. And this was the first step in a larger plan to do just that. So part of it was going straight to the manufacturers. As I understand, another part is what you call the last mile. There was some confusion about exactly how you get this PPE, this personal protective equipment, to the hospitals who need it. Right. And, and most of the folks here in and around Los Angeles already have great relationships with their transportation providers. So we're going to try to piggyback on that infrastructure. But where it's needed, we've got this great port, airport, and a distribution network that can help the small to middle-sized hospitals as well. So this is for the city of Los Angeles. You're a chief logistics officer for the city of Los Angeles. How does that fit with the state of California, for example, much less the federal government? How do these all fit together? Well, as a city employee, the idea was to try to help right out of the box through the mayor's vision, but we quickly found that there were needs in the broader county as well as the region. So we're working with all folks throughout this great area of Southern California to see how we can make a difference. We're not the answer to everyone's problems right now with inventory, but we think we can put a dent in it. And obviously, you know, the work around what we're doing right now is that we have to help ourselves and we have to move forward to build that LA stockpile that the hospitals can count on, not only now, but into the future. And we see three distinct phases. We're in a triage phase right now where we're trying to get any type of product we can to our medical workers. Second, as we begin to curb this illness over the future months, we're going to have to replenish this inventory. We're ready for that. And then longer term, the medical supply chain is broken. We think we can add value and we can pull people together with both information technology as well as the sheer buying and procurement capacity that the city of Los Angeles holds today. We hear reports that the state of California is about to start opening up at least some parts of the economy. How does this fit into that plan to reopen the economy in California? Well, the Port of Los Angeles has been running at about 80% of normal volume thus far in 2020. And the simple difference is that you and I are not out shopping, we're not dining and buying goods outside. California is slowly entering into a phase two, which would include the opening for curbside and online pickups of florist shops, clothing stores, music stores, and sporting goods outfits. So this will slowly move people in a direction where commerce can begin again. We have plenty of cargo in our warehouses. Southern California boasts the largest warehousing and distribution center construct in the world at more than 1.8 billion square feet. And so today, getting that product out domestically to the interior and our major hubs is front of mind. Cargo flowing through the port has never moved smoother, and we have plenty of capacity on our terminal tarmacs to grow as the economy opens up. And please remember that uh, the Port of Los Angeles moves cargo in and out of each and every one of our 435 congressional districts. So this work will be very important for us to have a line of sight as to what's coming in so we can speed the products through the marketplace. 
Yeah, Gene Sorocco, he is the Chief Logistics Officer of the City of Los Angeles, and I'm delighted to say he's going to be staying with us for the second hour of Balance of Power on Bloomberg Radio to talk about exactly what he just was talking about, which is the Port of Los Angeles and how it's doing. That, that does it for, that, I'm sorry, this is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. Welcome back to Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. IBM is holding its annual digital gathering today, but this year, this year is different. It's different in part because no one will be there. It'll be all virtual. And secondly, they will have 87,000 people participate. Last year, it was 30,000, which may reflect just how dependent we've all become on computers as we work from home. I talked earlier today with Arvind Krishna. He is the CEO. He has been for about a month now of IBM. And I asked him, basically, what are customers really seeking from them in order to make sure all these computers keep working for us? One of the products we'll announce here is in the category we call AI for IT. And the product is called Watson AI Ops. Outages in IT cost the industry about $265 billion. But that's, if we react after the fact, that cost is still there. If we can begin to predict what may go wrong, and be able to put it right in the workflow, right in all the collaboration tools, and fix it even before it happens, that brings huge power, unlocking the potential of AI for our clients. And that is something we really, really are excited about, in addition to the other hybrid cloud technologies we're also bringing out at this conference. So, so Arvin, I must say, those of us who are working from home and experience some of the glitches that happen are eager to have those corrected. When will that product be available? Will it really redeem some of the situations that we have where our system goes down? There's some problem, we have to reboot it, things like that. Uh, so that product actually is, is coming out now. We're announcing it at the conference in May and people can start purchasing it now for deployment in this quarter, meaning before, before the month of June. So that is a great, great power. But to talk a little bit more on AI, if you look at AI and its impact on COVID, something we're all unfortunately are suffering from right now, when I look at medical research in India, I look at government services in Poland, I look at hospitals in the United States, and these examples go across dozens of countries, we can all begin to use intelligent AI assistance to really take away and triage out a lot of uh, information that people are looking for. So in a hospital case, uh, parents who are anxious about their children can interact with the AI assistant and be, and that way you can take a thousand odd calls and take them out of the medical professional's hands, allowing the medical professionals to focus on the much more serious cases where the AI reacts with, hey, this is serious enough that you should actually have a person now interact. I think these are really useful examples to show how AI can go, not just in IT, as you pointed out, David, where we all would like all of our infrastructure to stay up all the time, and we do believe the tools in, in the next month are going to help there, but also in terms of helping our citizens and governments and medical professionals be able to help uh, everyone deal with COVID-19. So Arvind, you make a very important point there, mentioning various countries where this could be applied. Uh, the situation has been global when it comes to internet and digital. At the same time, even before the pandemic, there were some countries that are trying to draw some borders when it came to data, and when it came to some of the internet's issues. Are you concerned, do you see any indications that the pandemic problems that we're seeing may actually increase the resistance to flows of data and information across borders? Look, David, um, I'll, I'll sort of begin with my perspective. Um, of course, the economies are always going to, and nations are always going to try to advantage themselves. But when we step back, I think both global trade and the free flow of data have shown that the entire economy, the global economy gets better and everyone benefits. I think it's a false dilemma when people think about a win-lose. It's not a sports game where it's a win-lose. It's a win-win if you can increase the size of the pie for everyone. Now, I'll acknowledge that should come with regulations, that should come with protections, around IP, but the free flow of goods and the free flow of data is what unlocks the potential of all of this for everyone. And if you look right now, actually in the pandemic, I'm encouraged that people are more, are cooperating more. People are taking advantage of both cloud and computing capabilities from everywhere. The sharing of science research has increased. So there are some positive signs amongst all of the emotion 
that naturally uh, accompany such a crisis. That was Arvind Krishna. He is the CEO of IBM, and believe it or not, he will celebrate his one-month anniversary of being CEO just tomorrow. He's had quite a wild ride with the pandemic. That's going to do it for the TV portion of Balance of Power for today, but there's a second hour over on radio, Bloomberg Radio. Stay with us there as we're going to continue our discussion with Gene Soroka and talk about this, the Port of Los Angeles, how it's doing. We'll also talk with the Pennsylvania Attorney General about a new deal with DoorDash to serve the underserved poor populations in Philadelphia. This is Bloomberg.